and we're gonna go now we are live on zoom so when you come to sonoma oh abby two demerits uh good evening everybody and welcome to your friday sip event sorry for the two minute delay uh we had some technical difficulties which was purely on the seller angel side and uh we will take that up with mr zuckerberg again add that to the list of things we'd like to talk to facebook about but uh this is our 14th i believe sip event on a friday night uh 14th day 3000 we're unsure but i i do have a haircut so we'll talk at length about that because i know that will be riveting television but uh just to give everybody up to speed seller angels as you may or may not know if you're joining us for the first time is a private direct-to-consumer wine curator we specialize in wines solely from the napa and sonoma, sonoma valleys mm -hmm. and they're all for the most part limited production wineries like the guests we're going to speak to in a couple minutes most of the people viewing this evening actually are sipping the wine that we're going to be talking about because they went to the seller angels website and they acquired a custom sip kit so this is a kit that every single week changes and it will have the next six Fridays in a row wines that we're going to be featuring. And this allows you to literally have the winemaker, the owner in your living room, on your patio, wherever, talking about the wine that you're drinking. So we're very, very excited to be able to talk about the creator of the five vines that I have in my glass. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce a longtime friend of the company, a longtime friend of mine and Denise's, and uh, someplace, as you can see behind me, where he is, that's right outside his door. This is sitting on his back patio, uh, capturing a sunset last fall. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to introduce you to John Visley of Visley Vineyards. Thanks, Martin. Um, it's, a, it's truly a joy to be here. Um, our friendship has spanned 10 years plus, and... Yep. Um, uh, I, I, I can distinctly remember walking into your shop on Belmont and, um, and haven't looked back uh, since. It's been great. And um, you were very gracious uh, to me in the beginning as I, before I was even living here uh, at the winery, uh, you allowed us to do some uh, little wine events there at the store. And that was a, that was a, a, a really gracious uh, way for us to, to get started. And um, I, I'm just thrilled to be here with you tonight. This has been, this is an amazing thing, uh, the amazing thing that you do with the charities and the wineries. And we're just so glad to be a small part of it. No, we're, we're excited. And I do, it's funny, John mentioned the shop on Belmont. Many of you know, Denise and I actually owned a wine store in Chicago from 2007 to 2013. And we like to refer to ourselves as struggling, recovering wine store owners. Uh, because owning a wine store is a little bit like owning a restaurant or maybe even owning a boat where the famous phrase is, you know, your happiest day is when you buy the boat, your, your next happiest day is when you sell the boat. Uh, that was kind of our experience with the wine store. We loved all the people. And I do remember you and I sitting there uh, several evenings when you'd come in for a tasting and, and you kind of, at that time, we always refer to it as getting bit by the bug where someone says, you know what? I've actually done something. I think I'm, I think I'm going to go out and, and try to make wine and, and buy a vineyard. And I, I applaud the effort because it's just that that takes some gumption. That takes some tenacity. That takes just about everything from uh, character and resolve one can imagine. But you did it. I mean, you you left Chicago. Uh, not difficult in January to leave Chicago. But <laughs> but you, you left full time. You have a son still here. And now you're 10 years down the road. You own a winery, uh, you have a very, very loyal customer base, you're producing impeccable wines, and I'm interested in, in why on earth you, you wanted to leave a very, very successful career in commercial real estate and decide on, on, on trying your hand, you know, 1,846 miles away from Chicago and making wine. How'd that well, come about? Well, Hillsburg's 1,847 miles, so um, <laughs> I just, you know, just... Not, not that anybody's counting, um, you know, but honestly, Martin, it was just, you know, it was one of those things where throughout my, my life, while I was, you know, working, um, I would take vacations to wine country and, and it was just always something that attracted me. Uh, obviously the weather, the, 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 
the scenery, so to speak. You know, you, you, you come out to wine country, whether it's in France or Italy or South Africa or California or Oregon, wherever it may be, you find yourself saying, man, I think I could live here. I, 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 just, I feel good. And of course, everybody's feeling good when they're out drinking wine and, and tasting wine, I should say. No, uh, dr drinking works. I said the same thing this morning. Okay, Go on. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, we make a breakfast wine. Uh, you might not. I, I always recommend it. it's on the, the uh, nightstand next to the bed. Uh, so you can hit that puppy right first thing in the morning. Get the uh, day started right. It's a, it's a Chardonnay. Don't worry. It's a Chardonnay. It's, it's quite lovely. And um, but yeah, I'd always thought I'd love to live here. And um, and so, you know, when I had a, a, a series of rough days in the office, and just said, you know what? I don't know that I need to keep doing this. So it's like, well, maybe I'll just go get another job. And then it was like, no, no, no. It isn't about getting another job. It's about where do I want to live? And I've said to myself, I want to live in wine country for probably 20 years. Oh, so wow. why, don't, why don't I do that? How hard can it be? And so this was, yeah, how hard can it be? <laughs> Famous last words. So, so this was, so you wanted to live in wine country for 20 years and was it always kind of California wine country or was there any no. type of... No, not at all. Um, I first fell in, in love with wines um, up in Oregon, in the Willamette oh. Valley. Uh, Pinots and Chardonnays just uh, captured my heart right away. Uh, even when I would go and I would think that I'm going to buy Pinot and I'm, when I would get home and my boxes would get shipped to me and I'd start unpacking over half of what I bought was Chardonnay. And it was it, that clear to me at that time that I loved Chardonnay as much as I loved Pinot. Oh, and, that's uh, great. Yeah. And so, you know, then it just, it's, it's an evolution as, as you start drinking other wines and you start feeling out, you know, what your palate's like and, and what you're enjoying, you know, you kind of move from Pinot into Merlot's into Cabs. I mean, it's always kind of like a progression. Um, and that's what it was. So I just really enjoyed my, my time in wine country and thought, why not? Um, if it doesn't work, then I can fall back on just going to get a job. And, right. right. Let me, uh, let me raise a glass to a whole bunch of people that are on are saying hello. First of all, you got John Phillips, who I think you might know. Um, Very dear friend. John, who was on last week's SIP and is a dear friend. And we've had the pleasure of John's company here in Chateau de Cody. Uh, numerous times, uh, but Kim Vance is on and Kim is another winemaker who took the plunge and abandoned and left everything in Houston to come out to wine country and make wine. Uh, AJ Walker, good to see you, sir. Jeff and Jane Greasy have not missed a SIP event in 14 weeks. Ooh. So that is either dedication or they are bored out of their minds on Friday night and actually need a social life. Uh, but Jeff and Jane, we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you for that. And also thank you for the order of uh, Zinfandel this week. Uh, who else? The Randalls. Hello, uh, Tom Randall, of course. And uh, Carrie Schuster, I believe, is on as well. And I think that's it for now. And Julie Fogarty just jumped on. Hello, Julie. Uh, but here's one of the things. So this was in, what, 2009, you decided to actually... I need to skedaddle and go out of there. And one of the things I'm interested in, uh, for those of you who don't know where John is, and I'm going to, of course, show you Google Earth here in a second, because no SIP event would be, rem would be complete without Google Earth. Uh, John is just seven minutes south of downtown Hillsburg if you miss the light. So it's, it's really a, a spectacular place. How did you find this property? Well, Martin, that's, that's a, a great story in itself and it, a true testament to Sonoma County um, because I didn't start here in Sonoma County. I started over on um, the other side of the Mayakama Mountains, um, a little place known for their auto parts. And um, so we, uh, we you know, it, 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 as, as I kind of toured through Napa and um, mentioned to other wine owners that, uh, you know, I'm thinking about getting into business and they just kind of give you a side look and be like, why don't you go back to Chicago? And um, so, <laughs> so then somewhere along the way, because, you know, I talked to everybody and I, you know, it could have been a waitress, uh, you know, it, when I was getting my dinner, I'd be like, hey, I'm thinking about getting into the business. 
what do you think? Who should I talk to? You do, do you know anybody? Because maybe her dad's the guy I need to meet. I don't know. I'm just going right. to talk to people. And um, so it, in some of these conversations, somebody mentioned, why don't you check out Healdsburg? And I said, yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about going up that direction. So uh, sure enough, I hopped in the car and I drove up to Healdsburg. I, you know, went through the town. The town was just, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a picture postcard. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like Norman Rockwell worthy type of stuff. It, it truly is. And uh, so beautiful town square, great little shops, great little restaurants. And, um, you know, it wasn't until one of the other trips uh, when, when I brought uh, my son Tony with me. And uh, who, Tony is, uh, is, is my partner in the winery, and I'm, I'm sure he's watching. Cheers, Tony. Um, By the way, Tony, Tony, J J Tony would be here, but Tony uh, also had some technical difficulty. He's in Montana and has very, 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 very poor Wi-Fi. So yes. uh, I, I know he's here in spirit because this was going to be our Father's Day kind of uh, SIP event because I mean, your vineyard and your winery is, is really a total family affair. It's 100% family affair. Um, Tony, uh, he's been with me since the beginning. Um, my oldest uh, child, my daughter, Abby, she's been here since 2013. Uh, you know, basically, uh, as Denise said, you know, the glue holding everything together some days. Yep. And, um, you know, so anyways, I ended up walking into the tasting room in Kendall Jackson in downtown Healdsburg. This is 10 years ago. Um, actually 11, right? Because um, yeah. I don't know, about 10. And um, I said, hey guys, I'm thinking about getting into wine business. What do you think? And they just opened their arms and said, yeah, you ought to come out. You're going to love it. Come on out. I want to meet you, introduce you to some people, have you meet some people I know. So I went back and I, he introduced me to some people. And um, next thing I know, I'm pulling into the driveway here at the winery. And I'm like, this is it. I'm home. This is exactly what I have pictured in my mind. And, um, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Well, and it's, and it really is on Limerick Lane there, a, a pretty spectacular property. And I, I'm amazed that it was, you know, one of the first ones that you looked at. But one of the things that I also found extremely rare is the number of varietals that was being grown on the property. And I mean, that's unheard of. At, at one, correct me if I'm wrong. At, at one point in time, was there like 14 or 16 different varietals? Uh, it was 12. 12. 12 varietals, and, um, and there still are 12 varietals. Uh, I, I did last year do a little grafting um, and decrease the number of Zin vines that I have and replace that with some more Cabernet. Uh, and that's a, basically a direct result of uh, the wine that we're tasting tonight, the five vines. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, it's a, it's a blend of five different uh, varietals, uh, the big Bordeaux five, and... Um, Merlot is our, is our base wine, but number two behind that is Cabernet. And um, you see that I also have a bottle of Cabernet sitting next to me here. And um, we've done very well with Cab. It's, it's quite unusual to find a Russian River Valley Cabernet um, of this caliber. And uh, definitely a testament to the vineyard and uh, our location here. Even though we're in the Russian River Valley, we're at the very northern edge of North, uh, Russian River. And we're, we're, we're directly south of Alexander Valley and um, just slightly east and south of Dry Creek. So we get the Russian River Valley influences of the fog and the cool nights um, and temperatures that are much more moderate than um, up in Alexander Valley or Dry Creek. So we still get the heat, but we get that fog influence still. Uh, not as, as much as we would have south of us in the Sebastopol area, uh, deep in the heart of Russian River, and um, where primarily you're growing uh, the cool weather grapes of uh, Pinot and Chardonnay. And, and you're also kind of right in that area. Uh, and hello from Sean and Marilyn Manning, who have also spent some time on your patio, and they are complimentary in your gracious hospitality because they too have had this beautiful view, uh, and they said it was outstanding. And they they shared a bunch of wine with you or, or vice versa you shared a bunch of wine with them cheers uh, but aren't where you located you kind of have that confluence of dry creek alexander valley russian river and even a little bit of chalk hill kind of oh, yeah. come, comes together right in that little area so you've got the best of four different avas if you will absolutely and, 
and, and that's kind of neat in and of itself. And then you're right, the, the proximity to Healdsburg is amazing because you, you can just hop in the car, you're at a restaurant in under 10 minutes. And, and it's not just any restaurants. These eateries are incredible. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and we shouldn't overlook uh, the little town of Windsor just to the south of us. Um, every, Healdsburg is, you know, everybody wants to talk about Healdsburg, but the, the little town of Windsor has come a long way in the last 10 years. Uh, they've got some great restaurants and uh, lodgings as well in Windsor, uh, which is another maybe two minutes uh, to the south instead of going north. So uh, we've got a great variety of Windsor and Healdsburg and pretty much anything that you would want in between. Um, no, it, ama it, amazing grocery stores, um, you know, the restaurants, the wines. Um, one of the things I love about being here on Limerick Lane are my neighbors. Um, right. You know, I've got Limerick Lane next to me, Christopher Creek. We've got Miriam and Acorn and Fapiano. And, and believe it or not, Rodney Strong is a mile away from here. And uh, it's easy to pick on the big wineries, right? You can say, oh, well, you know, they're making a million cases and they can't give it the love that I can give. It's like, no, no, man, those guys are as dedicated as anybody else. Um, they're great people. They're a family owned uh, winery, uh, even though they're doing nearly a million cases a year. And, um, and, and we're all friends and, uh, and we've got a great little neighborhood group here. And when you come out to this area, you, you don't have to drive 20 minutes or half an hour to go find great wines. You now, can stay right here in this neighborhood and, and have a tremendous diversity of wine. Um, you know, they're, they're not all gonna be like my wines. Uh, they're gonna be their wines. And, right, and you're going to find yourself like in love with a lot of these these other wineries right here in the neighborhood. Let me actually, since you since you said that, uh, Jim Brubaker, another Coloradan, on, and I'm not certain Jim has missed an event either. Uh, and Catherine Jurisak, uh, thank you for joining. And Holly or Molly, I can't read the handwriting. Holly. <laughs> um, let me actually do this real quick so folks know where you are. And this is Jeff Greasy's favorite part of the night, in addition to the three poll questions. So let's show you where John's property is. Holly Murphy from Arizona, outstanding. All right, so I'll back up a tad. And by the way, for those of you, we get sent pictures, John, of people after these events, they say, hey, here's our spread for tonight. They're out on their patio. They've got a 42 inch or 60 inch television and, and they've got a charcuterie tray. Don't wait until after. If, if you're on Facebook and you wanna send that to Facebook right now, I would love to have Ivy comment on it. Now, I wanna see what you're tasting, where you're tasting, because several of you have some pretty spectacular setups. So here's, we'll, we'll, we'll zoom out from John's property and you can kind of see here's 101 and here's the town of Healdsburg. So you, you get to see just how close he is to this happen in Metropolis. And then Windsor's a little bit down here. And right. so it, it's, it's funny that you say Windsor because I never thought of that until the last time Denise and I were out and we were walking through that town. And so we've been going to wine country for 20 plus years. And I said, how have we never been here? This is storybook. This is, it's almost like a little mini Healdsburg. They have their, their town square. I mean, it is gorgeous. It really is. They've done a great job. And um, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they actually have got great uh, community leaders there. And, um, you know, Dominic Papoli is a friend of mine. He's the mayor. He's also one of the principals at Christopher Creek. Um, yep. And he's very, very active and proactive and uh, has done a, a lot of good for that town. And uh, I don't mind uh, saying that to the world. Um, I love the guy and he's done a great job. And it's hard to love a politician. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it, it also helps that he's down the street as a neighbor and it's always good. And you living in Chicago know a few things. It's always good to know the mayor. Just yeah. food yeah. for thought. And the alderman and yeah. yeah. So here's John's uh, house. And this is a guest house, by the way, that I've talked about uh, staying in and we'll talk a little bit more about staying in that as well uh, because John has graciously put together a pretty special offer for you uh, this evening and, and here's the winery and the 
the winery pool, the pool is not available for the winery, strictly guest house. Um, otherwise that would go south in a hurry. If, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a pretty spectacular area for certain. And, and one of the things, I mean, when you, Google Earth doesn't really do it justice. It's kind of cool to see the proximity to towns and stuff like that. But you can't see the degree of topography that you have behind me. So when you're sitting there on the patio and you're sitting in Adirondack chairs and, and John has lit a fire that uh, by all intents and purposes is not up to code, certainly not up to Chicago code. Uh, and, and you're just warming yourself by the fire, drinking into the wee hours of the night. Life is good. Life is very, very good. And you're drinking fantastic wines. And if you really behave, you might stroll back into the winery and thieve some of that Chardonnay out of a barrel that will knock your socks off. And the winery is, is where John is. He's sitting in his winery. Did you, when you got there, mm -hmm. did, did you, knowing your, your passion for Chard and Pinot, you know, kind of based on that, uh, visitation in Dundee Hills and Willamette in that area. Did you have any inclination of, you know what, I'm going to make a, a, the finest Russian River Pinot. I'm going to make a Chardonnay. What were the, the grand plans? If any? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, and that's the plan every year, Martin. Uh, the plan every year is to grow the greatest, the most precious grapes that we can, because that's, you can't make a good wine with bad grapes. You know, I don't care where you went to school and what kind of chemical uh, magic you can perform in the lab. Uh, if you don't start with good fruit, you cannot end up with a, with a super high quality wine. Um, you can start with high quality wine and not make a, or high quality grapes and not make a good wine. That, that happens. Um, yeah, you, you can screw that up, but you can't do you it the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, that's me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean, so we, we have amazing fruit and um, yeah, it's always the goal. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm my, my hardest critic, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, Abby taste this, this sucks. And she's like, dad, this is really good. I'm like, it's not what I wanted. It's not good enough. It sucks. And um, she like, dad, go to sleep, relax. We'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow. And you'll taste it with a fresh palate and, you know, maybe you'll realize it doesn't suck. It's okay. And, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you're passionate about it. You, you want to make the best wine that you can possibly make um, because you get to share it. That's the whole thing. It's like, you know, if, if I'm making this wonderful wine and it sits on a shelf, why did I make it? I want to share it. I want people to enjoy it. And, uh, and that's our goal, you know, it's basically spreading the love one bottle at a time. Well, I, I do know there's, there's a few people on that like to try to guess how the Vigneron winemaker made their fortune. So we have a first poll question on how John made his fortune. And uh, be I'm, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to launch poll question number one. So it's, get it's, ready. It's, and especially if anybody's been to the winery and they've asked me, uh, what I did prior to getting here. So here's poll question number one. John's career, as we already discussed, prior to winemaking was in commercial real estate. John was able to retire and buy a vineyard as a result of being the lead agent selling the Willis Tower to the Blackstone Group for 1.3 billion. True or false? Oh, I see a lot of votes coming in. It's neck and neck right now. I'm going to give this about 10 more seconds. I'm not going to give any indication one way or another. And five, four, three, two, one. True. <laughs> <laughs> you want to let a baby? You want to let him in on a secret? <laughs> John, John was not the lead agent. I, I don't even know how many zeros are in a billion. Um, the interesting thing about Blackstone, in fact, did buy the Willis Tower, uh, but it, they purchased it in 2015 and, and they've refinanced it twice since that time. Uh, so that can't be fun. Uh, but yeah, that would have been fun to be the lead agent on that. But, but those of you that uh, said false, you are one for one. 
Those of you that said true, there will be some uh, opportunities for redemption. So hang on to your chips. Those are speed round later for all the money. So that was, that's, that was a good one, Martin. That was good. Thank you. We, we have a crack research team, and which brings me up to uh, some breaking news on some sponsors that we have. I, I apologize. We actually don't have any sponsors. So there's, there's no wardrobe sponsors. LeBron James, those of you that have been here since the beginning, Le LeBron James said that he wanted a wine partner. We've been asking LeBron to say, hey, we'd love to partner with you if you want to have a drinking wine partner. Uh, but so far, no sponsors and no feedback from LeBron's people. Mm. But uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Missed it by that much. Missed it by that much. Missed by that much. So the, the passion, obviously, for Pinot and Chard were there. Uh, and I remember you had a very terrific palate, you know, when we were drinking in the store. And you also had a, a, a proclivity for old world wines. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, um, it's... You know, we, we make it definitely a California uh, style and also a Burgundian style um, wine. Um, and of course, what we're drinking now is a, is a Bordeaux. And, right. and I like to think that it's probably more uh, in, a, in a French or old world style than it is in a California style. And, um, and so walk, walk me through the five vines, because sure. I mean, most of the, our customers are all fairly sophisticated wine enthusiasts. They know that there's five grapes in Bordeaux uh, that uh, are the predominant grapes. And you've aptly named your wine five vines, but I'm very curious why the, it's Merlot dominant, which yes. is interesting. And is that by design or was that because I just had a crap ton more Merlot this year? <laughs> it's always gonna be Mer Merlot dominant. It's always gonna be a right bank style. Okay, so it is a nod to the right bank, okay. Yeah, it's a nod to the right bank. Um, and yes, we do, uh, we have, I should say in the past, uh, had more Merlot planted. Uh, of course, we made that switch last year and th we will be uh, harvesting our first crop of new Cabernet this year uh, from the graftings that took place last year. And uh, I'm very excited about that. The grapes look great. Uh, the grafts took off um, right away last year and they're strong and thick and i um, very excited about you know what's going to happen this uh, September October uh, with the Cabernet it's and I, I should really say just you know more of October because uh, Cabernet is one of the later uh, ripening grapes and we we, uh, we wanted to give it as much hang time as we can without developing too much sugar um, sugar as you all know is the direct correlation to alcohol the amount of sugar in the grape converts to alcohol. It's, it's, it's just a flat line. You know how much alcohol you're going to have based on how much sugar you start with. Um, unless something happens funky in the, in the fermentation process and it, it gets halted, uh, which we can do, um, you know, because the yeast are very temperature sensitive and they're also very sensitive to the amount of alcohol in the wine, which is why wines don't go really above 16%. Um, because the, the yeast can't survive in a high alcohol environment. So uh, just as a little sidebar, when you're making port, um, you're pouring high proof brandy, a great product, into wine that's still fermenting, still has sugar in it, and the yeast wants to consume that sugar, but now we've introduced a, a high degree of alcohol, the yeast cannot survive, preserves the sugar in the wine, and then we start to age it. So that, that's what happens there. Um, if you've ever wondered about how, why is it sweet and why doesn't it re-ferment? Um, it's because these can't survive in that environment. So getting back to the five vines, uh, you know, I, uh, I, one of, one of, some of my most favorite wines are, um, are definitely the, uh, you know, the Bordeaux wines. Now, you know, we named these five. There are a few other uh, wines or grapes, I should say, that are eligible to be grown in the Bordeaux region. That's a very highly regulated um, uh, industry over in France. I mean, if you're in Bordeaux, you're not growing Pinot, you're not growing Chardonnay, you're not growing Petit Syrah um, because they're not permitted to be grown there. Um, you can grow the five that we have here, which are Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Cab Franc, and Petit Verdot. But uh, you can also grow Carignan, you can grow Sauvignon Blanc, obviously. Uh, people don't realize that Cabernet Sauvignon is a, a hybrid grape. Right. Uh, 
it said it, it's its mother was Sauvignon Blanc, a white grape, and the father was Cabernet Franc. Um, so hence you have Cab Sauv. That's how that's how it got its name. Um, and so you got to watch that that racy Sav Blanc. She's a she, she's hell oh, on she's a hottie. Yeah, she's yeah, a hottie. hottie. Yeah, that's why she she's so came, good. She just came, came sauntering over from the Lower Valley and said, "Hello, boys." Hey. <laughs> We're not going there. We're not going nope, there. Not, not, not no, going there. No, no. Denise won't let us get there, Martin. She, she just said thank you off camera for not <laughs> going there. So, uh, and so you love the Bordeaux blends and you decided to pay homage to the right bank and, and use these five vines. And, and how do you determine the final blend? What is it? How long do you age it? Why is it magical? Because everyone I've had from, you know, 2012 on or 2013 on, everyone just gets better and better. Oh, uh, Martin, uh, when you come back, we'll pull out a bottle of 08 or 09. There's not a lot of them left. They're all in my private stash. Um, so this wine was being produced. We'll be on a flight by, tomorrow. Yeah, you can come get on out here, boy. Let's giddy up. Um, exactly. Yeah. But this wine was, this style of wine was being produced when I arrived on the property. And essentially, I loved it. And I said, hmm. you know what? Well, I'm not changing anything here. They, these grapes are grown here. And um, what I might change is, you know, what the percentages are. And that changes right. from year to year. And it's going to be based on yield, of course, and the quality of the wines. I mean, there's, there's times, there are years when I go through and I, uh, you know, I, I pull a thief uh, out of the barrels. I line up all the barrels and I pull wine out of each one and I put it in a glass and I taste it and I take a piece of chalk and I just write right on the barrel what my thoughts are. Um, and if I find something that I feel like is just really, really good, I'm gonna pull it off and it's not going into the five vines blend. So that's gonna change the character of the five vines. Um, right. But it also allows us to have a, another very small production wine that we typically will, will reserve for our wine club members uh, and give them something special, something that I felt was worth pulling out and not blending with the others and blending is not um it's it's not a four letter word or five letter word i should say um you know blending a blend uh, can be a very complex and you know, and, and and this proves it a very complex depth of wine uh, that you're not going to find typically in just a single varietal uh, because you've got all of these influences from the cab franc and the malbec you know they they and and it's not one percent or two percent it's typically going to be in the 10% range. So it actually does show up. Uh, you, you're going to find yourself at different points along the tongue, different flavors showing up. And, um, and, and that's one of the fun things about creating a blend like Five Vines is the complexity and the, the ability to kind of tease your brain a little bit. And, and, and every year, these wines, even though they're the same five varietals of grapes, the percentages are going to change a little bit. The flavors are going to change a little bit, but it's like looking at a at, at a row of sisters standing next next to each other, and you can just see it in their faces. They this is a family. These guys are related, right. and um, and and you see that with you know if we did a vertical of you know eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and we tasted them, you'd be like, wow, there was just this underlying similarity throughout each of these wines, but they all have their own character and you can gravitate a little bit more towards one versus another. And, um, and, and that's the beauty of wine because it's so subjective and we all have our individual palates and the things that we like. And so people say, well, what are your tasting notes? I'm like, I, I'm very hesitant to give tasting notes to people because I want you to tell me what your experience was, you know, I can't tell you, the, the, a few years back, the gal has sit, sitting here sipping some five vines. Mm. That tastes like Christmas. And I looked at her and I'd never heard that expression before. And I, you know, kind of thought that was weird. And I thought, no, it's not weird. You know, I mean, when we have these aromas and these flavors, what do they do? They they get attached to a memory, yep. right? And, and wine usually attaches itself to a very pleasant memory somewhere along your life. 
And for her to say it tasted like Christmas was maybe the greatest compliment she could give me because that is probably one of the best days of her life. Somewhere along the way, you know, Christmas is an enjoyable, family-oriented, just kind of love. And, 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 and it's what we think of at Christmas. It's like, you know, that, that warmth, that comfort, that love, that joy. And, um, and if you can get that out of a glass of five vines, whoo, I'll take that. I love it. Well, there's actually a, a question. You bring up two points. Well, first I'll do this because you talked about verticals and um, I'm going to get rid of Google Earth. Bear with me. And oh, just lost. Sorry. Hang on. I thought I could do it without cheating. I don't even know what that, I don't even know what that warning message means. <laughs> um, so can, can't see my screen, can you? That's what that warning message meant. <laughs> because John talked about vertical tastings and we did a vertical tasting uh, recently that was out of the park, uh, knocked it out of the park. And it was something that really a whole bunch of people fell in love with. And they said, you should do another vertical tasting. So now is my screen being shown? Yes. Okay. Uh, so John has graciously put together a vertical tasting of the five vines. So uh, when I say graciously, this is insane because now you do get to taste them side by side by side. And uh, you get to actually see th this is for us. This is kind of the most fun thing there is to do with wine uh, asterisk. I know Sean's thinking this with your clothes on, um, but <laughs> It, vertical tastings are the cat's meow. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but one of the things also about the wines is there's, there's tremendous balance in this wine. And Jeff Greasy, who I talked about earlier, also picked up on that. And it, it's, it's mild. It, it has some intensity. It has the fruit. It has a lot of the earthiness. So, so how are you able to accomplish that uh, year in and year out? And, and what is the magic behind the, the blending aspect that you're trying to go for? Okay, so- and John, and John uh, Jacobs, if I didn't say hello to John Jacobs, hello to John Jacobs. And Bill, Bill Best Design, another, uh, another two Chicagoans. Well, Bill's Evanston, but we are not gonna hold that against him. No, it's close enough. It's close Absolutely. enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, the, you know, that balance, um, because, you know, the, the other element that you didn't mention is acidity. And, um, you know, that's critical. Uh, in a wine, you know, we've got to have the right acidity and that's, that's actually going to allow the wine to age and, uh, and, and to develop and grow in that bottle um, for years and years and years, which is what we want. So um, you can have the tannins and you can have the fruit, but you've got to have the acidity to be able to kind of get that longevity and, and have that balance. Cause yeah, I, I, I get all those sensations along the, along the journey, along my tongue. And um, as far as the blending, you know, we literally go in, I told, talk to you about pulling the wine out of the barrels and having some in my glass and making some comments and, you know, grading it essentially on the barrel. But when it comes time to blending, what we're doing then is, is I'm, I'm thieping out, you know, enough to be in a say 375 or 500 milliliter bottle. Um, Cause I'm pulling out, with these little, they're called pipettes. Uh, you may right. remember, this, remember this from uh, high school chemistry. Um, oh, I, was a, I was a big chemistry guy. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know what a pipette is. I'm, I'm yeah. with you. Yeah. So, so we pull out and we measure 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters of cab, 10 milliliters of Merlot, 10, you know, start on a baseline. What do these five equal portions taste like? That's kind of like my baseline. And you can't just take that and take a sip and say, well, now I'm going to add some more because no, no, because you've changed the percentage when you took a sip. Right. So you, you've got to, you've got to kind of make your notes and start over each time, you know, you're kind of, you're building. And it's kind of like, well, what if I do this? What if I do that? And, um, and you're just taking notes and you're building on these blocks at 10 or 20 or 30 milliliters at a time. And then you're like, wow, I, you know what, I'm, I'm really, really liking this. And, you know, where am I at right now? Okay, 
Okay, yeah, yeah. And where does that leave me? Maybe it leaves me an extra barrel of Merlot. Maybe it leaves me, you know, I don't, whatever it might be, because every year it's a little bit different. You know, well, see, we, and, and that's, and you hit upon something there that, I, and I would love to get some feedback from the audience is to the insanity of that process. And, and I don't, I mean that in a good way, in, in kind of a, a mind melding way, because you've got five varietals. And so you're going to take 10, 10, 10 ml as your baseline. And then you kind of taste the, all five equal parts. And then you, you, you know, pour those out or pour them back or whatever. And then you start over and say, okay, now we're going to bump up the cab and then keep four the same. And then you taste that and you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. How much does palate fatigue factor in? Oh, greatly, greatly. Okay. And yeah. then, and let's keep in mind, you're tasting this out of barrel. So you, do you have to think about what's going to happen over a two or three year aging period? Oh, you do, but you know, you, you got to start with the good stuff out of the barrel because if you do it right, it's going to just get better when it's in the, in the bottle. Right? Okay. So, so you want to start with that really good out of the barrel. Like I'm really happy with this. Now I'm not going to allow it to go south on me after I get to that point. Uh, and I, once I get it in the bottle and I can lay it down for a year or two before I'm even selling it to the public, that's, that's my preference. And pe people always ask like your wine list, you, why aren't, why, why aren't you pouring me a 20, 18 cab. I'm like, well, because that would be sacrilege, right? right? You know, 2018 cab is probably still in the barrel and maybe it just recently got bottled and it, we're not going anywhere near it for a year. So, um, yeah, so that's just the way, that's just the way we, we do it. And, and maybe that's kind of that old world style. And, um, and we've been doing, we've, we've been able to do it because we haven't had, sometimes a winery will do that because market pressures. You know, 100%. They've, they've sold out of wine. So uh, what do we got? What do we got? Bottle it. Let's go. We need, we, we got to pour something for these folks. Right. And, um, you know, and so that happens. And that's actually not a bad uh, situation for the winery to be in. Um, you know, we haven't had that pressure. So we've been fortunate enough to turn it into an advantage for, versus a, a disadvantage. And yeah, that's, that's just kind of how it works. So the palate fatigue that is something that takes me usually a couple of days to settle on the blend uh, for one reason, because by the time I've, I, I've gone through about 10 trials, um, I think everything tastes really, really freaking good. Um, <laughs> so Abby, have I had this one? This is, yeah. I am kicking I ass. Did you try that? that is so good. Abby, come have some. And um, I am like, on um, fire this year. <laughs> so Abby will be like, um, you know, let's come back to this tomorrow, Dad. Yeah, I think it's probably time to wrap it up. And uh, <laughs> I'm probably That's giving her more credit than she deserves. But uh, well, the, and the the funny thing is, so you have to take you know meticulous notes to determine where the percentages are, especially when you are blending five. And then I th I think it would be interesting to come back to it, like you said, a day or two later. Look at your notes and with a fresh palate, and and maybe it's like, okay, I'm going to taste the last one of the other day, and I'm gonna taste that blend first this morning, fresh palate and see what, what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you probably have had to have experiences where you're like, huh, it's not as good as I thought it was the other day. Oh yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing that happens, and people don't realize this, and uh, I'm sure that your audience realizes that if they're gonna do a wine tasting, they probably should open that bottle an hour before the scheduled tasting and let that thing open up and breathe, right? So, I mean, just while we're sitting here doing our tasting, the wine in my glass is changing, right? Correct. So the wine is, I, when I pull it out of the barrel, now I have it in my glass, now I come back to it an hour later, and that wine is now like, wow, you know what? I mean, that extra 15 minutes of, you know, just resting, really allowed that wine to open up and really gives me a new appreciation for that wine. So all of these little details kind of come into play, especially, you know, when we're, when we're making a blend is like, you know, yeah, pull it out of the barrel, throw it in a glass and try it. Tastes great. It, there, there's nothing wrong with glass decanting. I mean, Oh no, 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 yeah. absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
But so, you know, if you, if you take a, you know, we're we're lucky here in wine country that um, when we go out to dinner, we take a bottle of wine or two or three with us, right? And when yeah. we walk in, first thing we do, you know, the host sees you have wine, and they don't even wait for you to ask them to open it. They're like, "Oh, John, can I take a bottle of that wine? Which which one would you like me to open first? You know, and they're on it. They're they're going to get that wine open. It's going to be sitting on the table. And, you know, we're going to have a, an appetizer and then a cocktail before, you know, the meal shows up and that wine is breathing. And then when we start having our meal, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, the wine is ready to accompany the meal. That's awesome. And it's funny because I've had the pleasure of having dinner with John a bunch of times out in wine country. And you do feel like you're with the mayor because John knows everyone in that town. And uh you might as well have your conversations with John prior to walking into the restaurant, because when you're in the restaurant, everyone knows John and you don't get a word in because they're all excited to see him. They all want to say hello. Uh, and his hospitality at the, at the house, at the custom house is no different than his hospitality in the restaurants because he will freely give his wine to people and have someone taste it. And I think that's, it's, it's not surprising to me that you had the experience you had in Sonoma because, you know, when you were out looking for properties in 09 and stuff like that, because it just seems that, that there's a, uh, a really communal effort to, to make certain everyone is successful as much as possible. Yes. And they, they do just open their arms and, and you're no different. So you are walking the walk and, and a living example of that as well. Is there, I'm going to switch to kind of some of the other varietals you craft. And, and I do want to... <laughs> I mean, we joke about thieving Chardonnay out of a barrel. I don't know what Chardonnay that was, by the way, uh, but it was freaking ridiculous good. It was, uh, yeah. this was after you approached the fire with a can of gasoline. Thankfully, it was diesel. It was diesel. diesel. It you, was never diesel. Put, you never put gas on a fire, it's diesel. Okay, well, I saw the gas can and I, you about had to peel me off the ceiling because we were gonna explode. Um, but we, so, so that was, uh, that was a, it was a teachable moment for me, you know, the teacher and the student. Uh, so thank you for that. But that did, did shark. We, was, was that, did we burn a barrel that night? Was, well, was we, that, I, I think we did. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that we do out here, um, which is kind of like one of my signature moves is I've got a, a giant five foot uh, uh, fire pit. It's on yeah. wheels and I pick it up on the fork with the forklift and I move it wherever I'm going to and we get a nice little base fire going and then I will throw an entire old barrel on the fire and and just let her burn and it's it's uh, it's a sight to see you know it takes an hour or so and you know the flames get to going and then the end pops off and then you can see inside the barrel as it starts to burn and it's just it's it is one of the coolest experiences you'll ever have. So just a shameless plug to uh, come stay at my house so that uh, we can burn a barrel for you. No, and, and I'm gonna do a more shameless plug because I talked about earlier at the top of the hour where John has put together a little bit of a package, speaking of the house, and it's a five bedroom house. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. You are feet away from the vineyards, uh, from the rows you wake up. You literally are staring right here uh, and, and it doesn't stink. But John is going to uh, complimentary provide you two weeks stay. I'm just what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for every three bottle purchase of Chardonnay. It's the most. It's the most amazing. Now, uh, in all seriousness, sign me up. Exactly. If you buy a case of the five vines, John's going to provide you a complimentary night with every two night stay. So if you're coming out on a Friday, Saturday, and you buy a case, either A, you're going to want to come out on a Thursday and just stay an extra night, or you're going to have one of those moments where you spend Friday, Saturday, and you're going to look at your spouse or the group you're with and say, yeah, you know what? This doesn't suck. Let's stay an extra day. And you're going to stay Sunday. Uh, and, and so it, it is a little bit of magic. And so for, for that, we thank you because that's a heck of an offer to have a complimentary night. Uh, on just a case purchase. So uh, that's all good. And I'm going to throw a, a, I can't even remember what my second poll question was, but I'm going to throw it here. So everyone get your fingers ready. Uh, this is a speed round. 
The Viz, oh, hang on, I have to share that. The Vizlay Vineyards is a 10 acre property producing on average, how many of cases of wine per year? This is, this is a good one. We have a, a, the team in the production studio, they are, thank you for that, they're amazing, the research they do. Um, and I don't think we talked about this earlier, so even the adroit listeners can, um, they may not know the answer, but so we're gonna give this about 10 more seconds. And by the way, uh, you may disagree with this because I got this from Tony today. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I couldn't remember. You know, so here we go, five, four, three, two, what's, <laughs> someone wants to go again, one. All right, here we go. Pretty good. 1,500 cases. 1,500 cases. 1, so, Martin, it's, uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut no, you off. I, No, please. No, I was going to say, um, that's, that's basically what we produce out of the vineyard. Um, we, what we do is we grow grapes and we make wine. Uh, we're not grape purchasers. We're grape growers. Um, so just kind of a, what, we, what we do today um, under our original business model is we grow our own grapes. We make our wine in our winery. Um, everything is aged here. It's bottled here. So it's, it's really under our control and our care uh, for that entire process from, from when it's on the vine until it reaches your home. It's pretty much under our care. Um, but we have the, the capacity here on, under our permit to, to make up to 10,000 cases. And so uh, we may uh, find ourselves one day taking a look at buying some, some great uh, fruit. Uh, you know, we've got wonderful neighbors, not only here, but we can buy fruit from wherever and, uh, and, and make additional wine if, if that's what we choose to do. We'd have to throw up another building um, to, to be able to, uh, to house the barrels. Um, but, you know, at some point in time, it's been 10 years and we have to look at, you know, how we want to grow in the future and how we want to reinvent ourselves. Um, and just a little side story, you mentioned Tony, uh, my son earlier, um, and I said, we're grape growers, right? So a few years back, this is maybe five years ago, six years ago, I get all excited because a buddy of mine approaches me and he says, hey, John, you know that Sauvignon Blanc that, uh, that I have over in Dry Creek? And I'm like, oh, yeah, man, that, that makes some really, really great wine. He's like, well, I've got a couple of extra tons, and I can let it go to you at cost. And I get all excited. And I start thinking. I'm like, I'm excited, right? So what do I do? I call Tony. Tony, guess what? I got a line on these really good grapes. It'll be a really great wine. It's a really good price. And Tony says, uh, it's not what we do, Dad. We grow grapes. We don't buy grapes. He says, I'll make you a deal. When you sell all the grapes that you grow, you can go buy more grapes. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, he kind of, you know, popped my bubble. You know, I settled back down and I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. We have a plan. We, we are executing our plan. We're growing grapes. And until we exhaust all of that and we can't keep up with demand, we won't be buying grapes. So, now that, um, And that's another example of people off camera that are the glue holding the operation together. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, as a winemaker, uh, you know, we, we tend to be on the art, art side. You know, there, there's two sides, really. There's the science side and the art side, and it's a blend. It, it really, you know, you've, you've got to have a little bit of the science and a little bit of the art, and typically winemakers are going to be a little bit more one way or another. It's, uh, it's rare to find somebody that's really kind of balanced that way. So I find myself um, more on the artistic side of things. Um, and that's why Tony is a great balance for me um, because he's a scientist at heart. He's got, you know, chemistry and biology and math degrees. And, you know, he, he understands stuff that I'll never be able to understand. And God bless him. Um, yeah. You know what? I really don't even want to understand some of that stuff. Um, that's but, why you have them. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, so he brings that balance to me. But, so it's very, it, very easy uh, to be a winemaker and get excited and start thinking artistically about something or romantically about something. And then you need somebody that says, you know, that's not in our plan. You know, that doesn't really pencil out. 
it's a great idea and you know it may be a fun little side project for you someday but that's not what we're doing here we're, we're you know we we've got obligations and we have a business to run and um, you need to stick to the plan so right. it's kind of kind of a fun little side story there about you know hey I got it I got a line on some grapes and uh, yeah no and it's and it's funny to have that anchor if you will to, to say hey nope let's focus and and one thing and I know I, I can't believe we've already gone through an hour but one thing I want to talk two things about I talk about not one two uh, Prosecco you actually make a sparkling wine we do so uh, the, the fellow that we bought the winery from uh, one of the reasons that we have 12 varietals is that um, he wanted to do some things a little bit differently. And so this was way back in the mid 2000s that uh, he obtained some Prosecco cuttings and grafted over and we have two rows of uh, Prosecco grapes. So it was um, shortly after we got here that the Italians and the, and the, and the government, uh, the US government, the Italian government agreed on a trade deal and, um, and the Italians protected the word Prosecco. So for literally decades and centuries, the grape varietal uh, was synonymous with the region of the Prosecco region of Italy. So uh, what they did was they more or less officially renamed the grape Glera, uh, which is maybe one of the most ugly names a wine <laughs> or grape could have. And, um, and so, uh, even though we had been growing it and producing it, it wasn't registered with the TTB at the time. And um, so we could not grand be grandfathered in uh, right. under the Prosecco uh, term. So um, we, we basically uh, label ours as a brut uh, cuvee, um, brut being dry. Uh, sure. I'm, not, I'm not a real fan of kind of sweet bubbles. Um, I like the drier style and typically... Um, I make what I like. So, um, yeah, we do, we do grow some, unfortunately, a few years back, we got hit with Pierce's disease pretty hard in the Prosecco. Um, mm -hmm. so that's a disease that, um, um, the vector is a, a, a small, uh, sharpshooter called the glassy wing sharpshooter, uh, similar to a mosquito, if you will. And it would just basically fly from anywhere, 10, 15, maybe at most 20 feet from one vine to another and it would pierce the the trunk the um you know the bark of the of the vine right. and and infect it and and the prosecco is one of the most susceptible of varietals to that pierce's disease uh, and literally within months not years uh the vine is dead it just immediately it starts to dry up and it's dead and it's no coming back from it so we had to pull out um, about half of the Prosecco. And oh, we're just now getting to the point where um, we've got the, the replants that are growing and um, are large enough now that we can start grafting. Uh, so we save cuttings from uh, the pruning. Uh, when, when, the, when, when the guys come through and they prune the vineyard, uh, we save canes uh, because these canes have buds on them. And um, it's, it's, it's the craziest thing. Uh, you know, you kind of get them a little damp, wrap them up in some newspaper, put them in a, I'm going to say a warm refrigerator. You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, you don't want it 40 degrees. You want it more closer to 50 degrees. Um, so it's cold and kind of dormant, but it doesn't freeze them or damage them um, with a really cold temperature. And then you pull it out and um, the guy looks at them, you know, you cut right into it. And it's like, yeah, it's green. It's viable. It's basically alive. Um, Good. and, uh, they can take and they can graft that in and the next year you're going to get fruit from it. So we're almost at a point where, uh, we can, uh, start making Prosecco again. Right now it just kind of gets blended in with the Chardonnay. Oh, good. I'm, I'm looking forward to sitting on that patio with a glass of sparkling. I've got two questions for you. Yes. Uh, well, actually one question for the audience. In John's world, what is more challenging? commercial real estate or owning and running a winery? Now don't answer yet, John, because I actually don't, uh, but I'd be curious what the audience, then the final question, a lot of, next question, a lot of West Coast money coming in late. 
people are trying to figure out what the sign says behind you. But don't, don't tell anybody yet. So here we're going to end this. Owning and running a winery is the winner. What would you say is harder? Amen, brother. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, owning and running a winery is uh, uh, a unique set of challenges. And thank God we've got great neighbors and friends in the industry. And, um, and, and, and that's what gets you through it. You know, well, not only that, it, 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 and you're right. I mean, having run and owned a retail wine store and now a, a digital business, I think one of the saving graces is, is A, you can drink your product. <laughs> I mean, and, and Denise, and by the way, I want, I want to compliment you on your product on two things. One, I, I, the five vines is outstanding. Um, but you. also people, you know, John is, is no foreigner. He's got his name on the cork and phone number on the cork. So that's what a small producer does because they want to be connected to the consumer. And so if you are popping a bottle of the five vines and you're at a, you know, a barbecue with some friends and you want to call John, uh, the numbers on the cork. Now the final question, what Martin, does, the I, I, I shouldn't say this, but that's actually my cell phone number. You, you, ooh, you should not say this. And, and it's, I'm sure it's forwarded to Tony. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what does the sign say behind you? Because the picture gets cut off. All we see is K E C A. So you're gonna have to rotate the camera. Okay. 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 All right. Are you ready? Yep. Keep calm and pour on. Nice. Yeah. That is Stay words. Safe. That is words to live by. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to read from my notes. Um, first of all, I, I want to obviously thank John. And uh, we wouldn't be here without John's kindness and hospitality and graciousness. And, and I'm not kidding you. You folks need to go to, to Healdsburg. You need to spend some time. Uh, he's actually in the tasting room. And then he could open up those doors right over his right shoulder. And you would be looking out into the vineyard. It's You're 10 feet away from the grapes. And, uh, and then I would encourage you to, if you are interested in, in purchasing one of the Vizlay vertical kits, that's a ton of fun. That's available on the website. Uh, you all know about Cellar Angels Charity because every single purchase benefits a charity. But what you may not know is John also has a philanthropic bent to him as well. And so for anybody that purchases a case, not only would you be able to uh, get a complimentary stay at the the beautiful house uh, with a two night purchase, but John's also going to then throw in 50 bucks to vineyards to vines. No, vineyards to villages, vineyards to villages uh, where this is an organization that John actually has uh, been deeply ingrained and in part of uh, for a while where these folks go and dig wells uh, in Africa for villages that just don't have access to clean water. <laughs> and, and not only is water, an important necessity of life. Certainly it's an important necessity of vines as well. It goes without saying that uh, we always like supporting the family farmer and our most recent charity, as you know, is Save the Family Farms. And, and they are an organization dedicated to doing just that, the limited production family farm winery. So uh, without them, we don't have folks like a John Visley producing this type of juice, crafting this type of blend, and really being able to have this type of hospitality. Next week, we will have uh, Adam and Stacy Sobralski, Adam Hursley and Stacy Sobralski of Hursley Wines, a husband-wife duo that, again, painstakingly small amount of wine produced, uh, but just uh, very dedicated to the caliber of the fruit. As John mentioned, you can't make good wine with bad fruit. So you really have to pick where you get your food from. Uh, I don't want to go because I just have too much fun with John and I could sit here. Uh, I'm not going to burn a barrel tonight, but um, I, I think we could, we could actually watch that. But Mr. Visley, it's an honor as usual. And Abby, thank you so much for all the behind the scenes uh, technology work. And, and we are indebted to you. Keep making the good stuff and um, fight on and, and we will see you soon, I certainly hope. Thank you, Martin. It's been a pleasure to be here with, uh, with everybody tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed the wines and um, please feel free to order more wine, whether it's the vertical or whether it's the case steel and um, come visit us. Even if you're not staying at the house, uh, come and have a tasting with us, sit on the patio, we'll pour you some wine. It'll be fun. Yeah, it, it doesn't stink, I'll tell you that much. John, thanks so much, we'll talk soon. Thanks, and everyone else, stay safe and have a great weekend.
Cheers, and we'll see you next week. Cheers, everybody.